All right, what is up? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Noah. You can find me on Twitter at no more parties. You can find my written work at breakoutfinder.com, playerprofiler.com, and I do video shit here. Today's video, I'm going to be going through my top 10 pre-combine running back ranks for the 2022 rookie class. We don't have athletic testing data yet. We don't have draft capital. We don't have landing spot, but I wanted to go through, get on wax, you know, before the combine, who do I have as my top five running backs? Uh, before I get into that, I wanted to quickly address a question that I've gotten several times lately. You know, I'm like sharing all this information, all this research about these running backs. But like, does the shit actually work? Like, is there any utility for it as we project guys to the NFL? Which is a completely like <laughs> legitimate question. It's a little bit of an interesting question as far as like what I'm doing is concerned. Because when I started out doing this, my intention was never to like predict fantasy points or like perfectly, you know, figure out which guys are going to score the most, most fantasy points in the NFL. Like that, that was never the goal. I'm much more interested in like just like learning about players, understanding the kinds of players that guys are, um, evaluating just like talent in a vacuum as much as I can. Like that's what's interesting to me. Um, but I do understand that like in creating content, the utility of this is in the context of fantasy football. So I realize that that's important and I have tested my process against NFL production. Like I, I don't think it's the most, how do I say this? I don't really like testing like statistical models or like training them on like fantasy points per game or fantasy finishes because like as we know a large element of scoring fantasy points is the environment in which a player operates a less talented player can score more fantasy points sometimes significantly more fantasy points than a much more talented player given a disparity in situational factors like Todd Gurley was good on the Jeff Fisher Rams. He was the number one player in fantasy on the Sean McVay Rams. And like, sure, you could make the argument that he became a better player, but I think it's pretty obvious that his situation improved drastically. So your evaluation of Todd Gurley's talent was degrees of right or wrong, depending on external factors that had nothing to do with Todd Gurley or your evaluation of him. I don't really think that's the best way to evaluate whether or not your evaluation was correct or not. And so I prefer to use like market share stats, um, specifically dominator rating. Also not a perfect representation of player talent, but I think it's a better representation than like fantasy points per game is because it uses the context of the environment a player operates in. You know, if a guy is good enough to post a 30% dominator rating, He's probably going to post around a 30% dominator rating, whether he's playing on the worst team in the league, the best team in the league, or a middle of the road team. That's not true if it's of his fantasy points per game output. So I think dominator rating is a little bit better in that sense to get an idea of like how good you are at evaluating. So that's what I used. The R squared value, um, which is basically just means like how strong something correlates to something else. The R squared value of the pick at which a player was selected in the NFL draft to his career dominator rating. And by career, I just mean through his age 25 season. I'm not really concerned with like age curves and how, you know, longevity and things like that. Just during their prime, what were these guys doing as producers in the NFL? The R squared of draft pick to career dominator rating is 0.227. The R squared of draft round is 0.254. And the R squared value of prospect score, like my process is like overall composite rating I give to players, kind of like a Madden rating, I guess. Two career dominator rating is 0.274. So it's beating both draft pick and draft round. And if you combine the three of them, if you look at prospect score, the round and pick a guy was selected with, the R squared value of that to dominator rating is 0.347. So while it's not really my goal, <laughs> I am beating draft capital by a little bit. And when using my process in conjunction with draft capital, it's a pretty substantial improvement. So there's that. As far as the efficiency metrics on their own goes, um, I honestly have no fucking idea. I don't test those against their like NFL versions, mostly because I haven't been keeping track of the NFL versions as much as I have been, you know, looking at the, the college versions. A lot of the like box count data I've only been keeping track of recently. I only have going back like three or four years. So there's not a large data set to like compare to, you know, to compare those specific metrics to what those players do in the NFL in those metrics. So I honestly just don't know, but they are part of a larger like mixture that is beating draft capital. And because I've gotten this question recently, I looked into it and 
in the last five years, so since 2017, if we look at top 24 finishers in fantasy, half PPR, ignoring guys like J.D. McKissick, Antonio Gibson, Cordero Patterson, like guys like who played wide receiver in college, I wouldn't have been evaluating them like as running back prospects. I evaluated Antonio Gibson as a running back prospect, but I digress. It, looking at guys who played running back in college and the top 24 finishers in fantasy football last five years and half PPR, 84% of RB1s and RB2s had positive team relative efficiency in college. So that's a pretty large majority. I think it's worthwhile to look at team relative efficiency. It's intuitive. And most high-end fantasy running backs were efficient relative to their teammates in college. So I think what I'm doing is probably not a waste of time. I think it has some value. So there's that. Um, let's get into the rankings. First of all, I'll just kind of delineate, like, these rankings are not the order in which I would select guys in a rookie draft. Like, Isaiah Spiller is going to be lower on my list than he is in consensus, but that doesn't mean I'm going to take guys, you know, if a guy I have at RB4 has a rookie draft ADP in the third round, and I have him ahead of Isaiah Spiller, who's being taken at the 105, that doesn't mean I'm pulling up a third round guy to select him at the 105. Like, that would be silly. It just means I think that that guy in a vacuum is a better player than Isaiah Spiller. Like, Obviously, if I'm ranking guys for a rookie draft, I'm taking into account landing spot and draft capital. I'm not doing that here. This is in a vacuum as much as possible. Who do I think are the best running backs in the class? So let's get into it. I'm going to start at RB1 because it's obvious who it is and there's no reason for, you know, suspense. But after that, I'll go RB10 to RB2. But RB1 is Brees Hall. Basically, the thing with Brees Hall is he was a dominant producer, broke out at 18, 97th percentile, his true freshman season at Iowa State, he had an 80th percentile dominator rating, his sophomore and junior seasons, 94th and 95th percentile dominator ratings, so elite, elite producer, um, he's a big dude, six foot, 220 plus pounds, that's like prototype size, I think he's a passable receiver, he averaged 27 receptions per season in college, that's an 87th percentile number, his target share is fine, just under 11%, which is a 67th percentile number, and he was relatively efficient. 7.4 yards per target, 83% catch rate, those are in the 70th and 75th percentiles. However, he wasn't used incredibly dynamically as a receiver. He was split out wide or in the slot less than 5% of the time, and his average depth of target was negative 0.6 yards, so those are in the 24th and 31st percentiles. So the degree of difficulty in his receiving usage was not high, but he was, you know, being asked to run, you know, like simple swing passes, screens, things like that, and he was doing fine on those. I don't think he is an excellent receiver, but I think he's good enough to play on all three downs, and he's also a good runner. He handled a lot of volume in college, 718 carries, which is an 87th percentile number, and he was efficient relative to his teammates. He averaged 0.65 yards per carry greater than other guys at Iowa State, which is just above average in the 56th percentile, but if you account for the box counts he was seeing, the average Brees Hall carry was worth 125% the output of carries for all non Brees Hall runners at Iowa State, which is an 83rd percentile number. He was also really good in the open field. He converted 38% of his 10-yard runs into 20-yard runs, which is an 81st percentile number. I have a little bit of concern over the, like, shape of his rushing efficiency profile. He was, you know, a big play guy, and that resulted in him having positive team relative efficiency. But on a down-to-down, -down, like, consistency basis, he wasn't as impressive, which is a little concerning. His 10-yard run rate was lower than his teammates. It's in the 36th percentile. And his relative success rate, which looks at how often he's gaining the, you know, requisite amount of yards given down in distance relative to the box counts he was seeing relative to his teammates is only 1% higher than the other guys on the team, which is obviously better than theirs, but it's only in the 53rd percentile. So there's a little bit of concern that his positive efficiency is fueled by like these long runs where like play in and play out, he might not be as consistent as, as we would like to see. But despite that, like, slight fool's gold risk, he's, you know, easily the most complete package in this running back class. Um, there's not really anybody else I would pivot to at RB1. It's easily Brees Hall. So there's him. Let's get into the rest of the top 10. At RB10, I have Kyron Williams. This is significantly lower than a lot of other people are going to have him. He's pretty consensus, like a top four, maybe top five back in this class. And that's because there's like a lot of good things to like about him. He broke out early as well at age 20, 61st percentile. 
That was in his uh, true sophomore season, and as a sophomore and a junior, he posted 70th percentile dominator ratings on teams at Notre Dame that were really good. You know, they were national championship contending teams. He uh, was a productive receiver. He averaged 36 receptions per 12 games. That's a 96th percentile number. His 13% target share is an 83rd percentile number, and he's a small dude. He was only listed at 5'9", 199. So not even 200 pounds in college, but if you have concern over his ability to like handle a large workload, he demonstrated that ability. He averaged 229 touches per 12 games, which is 83rd percentile, and it's top 20 for sub 200 pound backs, like going back to 2007. So among all the small guys that have come out of college in the last decade and a half, his college workload is in the top 20. So pretty impressive. The rest of the Kyron Williams profile is a little bit interesting, and it's it has me think thinking in terms of, like, I'm not even sure if this line of thinking makes sense, but it's something I've been tossing around in my head. Like, he looks really good in metrics that I would classify as implicit. And an implicit metric would be something like breakout age, where it sort of, like, feels around player performance and, like, suggests something about the player, but doesn't explicitly, like, show you anything. You know, if he broke out at 20, that kind of feels around his performance and you know, suggests that maybe he was more physically developed at a younger age than other guys, or maybe he didn't require, you know, greater physical development in order to be a productive player. Or maybe it suggests that he's just like purely more talented or, you know, more skilled than other players were at at a younger age. But it doesn't actually give you anything concrete to say about a player other than for some reason he was productive at a younger age than most guys are. An explicit metric would be something like catch rate, where, you know, it tells you something tangible. He was throwing the ball this many times, he caught this percentage of them. And I understand that there's context around that, like, how good is his quarterback? How, you know, accurate are these passes? How far down the field is he going to, you know, get these passes? But, you know, on a literal level, how often is he, was he throwing the ball? How often was he catching those pass attempts? It's something concrete. It tells you something explicit about a player's performance on the field. And in these metrics that sort of, like, exist in a continuum between implicit and explicit— Kyron Williams is impressive in a lot of more implicit metrics, and the explicit metrics are where he looks not nearly as good. Some of those would be, like, as a receiver, his yards per reception, only the 34th percentile. Yak per reception, 33rd percentile. Yards per target, a little bit above average, but only 56th percentile. Still lower than, you know, his volume stats, his his target share numbers. On the ground, his box-adjusted efficiency, 24th percentile. Um, Relative success rate, 43rd percentile. Just pure yards per carry relative to his teammates, 30th percentile. Breakaway conversion rate, 44th percentile. He's consistently below average in a lot of these, like, in a vacuum metrics that just look at his performance on the field where, you know, kind of the bird's eye view things, he's more impressive. And that's a little bit concerning to me. You'd like a guy to look good from a bird's eye view. And then when you look at him in a microscope, he continues to look good. And that is not the case with Kyron Williams. You know, a lot of guys from the past, like, you know, Benny Snell, Trey Mason, Toby Gerhardt, Carrion Johnson, like Jamar Jefferson in this last class, also good in implicit metrics, not so much in explicit metrics. We've seen guys succeed like that, you know, Devontae Freeman, Melvin Gordon to a certain extent, Carlos Hyde, uh, Darren McFadden was a lot like this. So it's not a death sentence, but it is like a red flag for me that says that maybe he wasn't as good as his production profile suggests he was. He did produce the way that he did. You know, he was young, at a powerhouse program, was productive. That means something, which is why he is as high as he is in my rankings. He's a top 10 guy. But I think the bottom line is he was like a prolific receiver, not an efficient receiver, not an efficient runner. He wasn't used incredibly dynamically. He wasn't used like down the field, like, you know, you might want to see from a a high-end satellite back. His A dot was only in the 41st percentile. I just don't see what there is in the profile that would indicate that he's something other than a third down guy. I think he has the capability to handle a workload, but I don't know that he has the skill set to be like a three down, you know, lead back in the NFL. I just just don't quite see it with him. So he lands at my RB10. On to RB9. My RB9 in this running back class is Isaiah Spiller. Um, his sort of like profile is is similar in ways to Kyron Williams's, where in implicit metrics like breakout age, 99th percentile, he's got an August birthday, was immediately productive in the SEC at Texas A&M, great breakout age. Um, he had quality dominator ratings on, you know, quality A&M teams, you know, again, in the SEC. His, you know, market share stats were never incredibly high, but they were fine on good teams, which is, you know, often good enough. I don't have a problem with that. He was also productive as a receiver. 
25 receptions per 12 games, 85th percentile. Target share in the 60th percentile. Uh, he's also a big dude, you know, like Brees Hall, 6 foot, 220, prototype size. Then again, back to these explicit metrics where he doesn't look as well. Yards per target, 35th percentile. Yards per reception, 23rd percentile. Yak per reception, 26th percentile. Catch rate, 38th percentile. I see a lot of film guys like comparing him to like Le'Veon Bell or, you know, these these other like three down workhorse runners in the NFL. And while I think he has the capability to do that, you know, he demonstrated an ability to, you know, be involved in the passing game. He's got size so he can play on first and second down. I don't know that he's like a plus in the passing game. He seems fairly average there to me. I know like Lance Zerline of NFL.com um, recently released like his his film grades and he has some similar thoughts on Isaiah Spiller that he needs some work on his hands and things like that in order to reach the level of like a three down contributor in the NFL. And as a rusher, Isaiah Spiller was just not good. He saw lighter box counts than his teammates did and even with that like easier path to efficiency, he was significantly less efficient than those guys. Um, his yards per carry in the 11th percentile relative to his teammates. Box adjusted efficiency relative to his teammates, 11th percentile. Relative success rate, you know, compared to his teammates, 9th percentile. So not an incredible big play guy, but also on a play-to-play basis, he's not succeeding on his carries as often as the other guys on the team despite seeing lighter fronts than they were. So not a great look. Basically what it comes down to is I think he's got three down ability, but he's less like a bell cow and more like just one of these three down like blah backs in the NFL, like Kyron Hill, Carrion Johnson, TJ Yeldon, like Mike Davis. I think he has some utility. I don't think he's an impact player. So that's where I got him. RB9. On to RB8. RB8 is Letty Brown out of West Virginia. He was a decent producer, Power 5 conference. He broke out at, um, in his third season, which is 54th percentile. In his junior and senior years, he posted 76th and 78th percentile dominator ratings, which are fourth in the class among FBS runners and second in the class among Power 5 runners, respectively. So pretty impressive production as an upperclassman. And I think he also has three down ability. He's 5'11", 216 you know, just a little bit above average. Um, He handled a lot of volume as well, 620 carries in his college career. That's in the 75th percentile. His efficiency relative to his teammates is okay, not great. His box-adjusted efficiency rating, 114%, just in the 50th percentile, so literally just right at average. But his relative success rate was 5.9%, which is an 85th percentile mark. So he's not a big play guy, but on a consistency basis, he's doing more given the box counts he's facing than his teammates are, which is a good look. And I think he's a solid receiver. He wasn't, you know, super efficient or anything. He actually was fairly inefficient. Um, Seven yards per reception, 5.3 yards per target. Those are 12th and 28th percentiles, so not great. But he was involved. 24 receptions per 12 games, 12% target share. Those are right around the 80th percentile each. And he was used fairly dynamically. He was split out wide almost 13% of the time. That's in the 72nd percentile. And he was targeted downfield. His ADOT is 0.6 yards, which is in the 60th percentile, which it makes sense that a guy would be slightly less efficient on these like higher degree of difficulty plays. I'm not willing to say he's like a tremendous receiver, but I think he's passable there. I think he has three down ability. So, I think it's his is a fairly straightforward evaluation. You know, I don't see a lot of film guys excited about Letty Brown. I think he's probably fairly boring, but good size, good production, fine receiver, fine runner. I think he's an unspectacular, like, three-down utility guy. Maybe a little jaggy, but I think he's a quality player. At RB7, to kick off the part of the video where I'm actually excited about these players, is Zaquandre White out of South Carolina. Um, His production profile on the surface is not incredible. Um, He started out at Florida State, where he, um, his first season, he didn't do much at all. I believe he redshirted. His second season, he played linebacker a little bit, was playing linebacker and special teams. Um, So he transferred to a community college where he blew up. Um, He had a 38% dominator rating, which is in the 85th percentile among third-year players. And if you just compare that to other guys who played at like non-FBS programs in their third season, it's better than David Johnson, Chase Edmonds, James Robinson, Rashad White in the same draft class. So just in that context, he looks like a high-end running back. You know, went to a small school, but dominated there to a similar level as guys who we've come, you know, who we've seen come to the NFL and then be good players. So that's encouraging. And my thought is, you know, 
after he, you know, left community college and he then transferred to South Carolina, where he barely played as a junior, and then this last season in 2021, his fifth year in college, he had like a 20% dominator rating as part of a committee. So, again, not impressive production, but I go back to that third season. If he had stayed at the non-FBS level and continued to play, you know, not a, not necessarily a community college, but if he went to some F- FCS program and was a similar producer there as guys like David Johnson and Chase Edmonds, we would look at him as like that level of prospect. Should he be knocked in our evaluation because he then decided to go to South Carolina and play at a higher level? To a certain extent, like you got to take his production at face value for what it is, but also... In the hypothetical world, like, why would we not consider him to be, like, an Austin Eckler level guy if that's the way he was producing, you know, at the same level of competition that Austin Eckler faced? So, I'm inclined to, like, give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt for that. And also, supposedly he's a physical freak. At the Senior Bowl, which he weighed in at and then left for some reason, he didn't actually participate in practices or the game, but his weigh-in at the Senior Bowl, he was 5'11 and a half, 212 pounds, so a little bit undersized for the size of his frame. In high school, up on playerprofiler.com, they have his high school testing numbers, 4'5", 1, and the 40, 4'2", 4 in the shuttle. Those would both be above average for guys at the combine, and he did them in high school. And his high school vertical leap was 43 and a half inches, which, as far as I can tell, would be the best vertical among running backs at the Combine since at least 2007. So, dude allegedly is an athletic freak, so that's exciting. I also think he's a dynamic runner. Obviously low volume given his lack of production, but his box-adjusted efficiency, the average carry for Zaquandre White was worth 119% of the average carry for other guys, like basically just at South Carolina, uh, which is in the 71st percentile. Also in the 71st percentile is his relative success rate to those guys which indicates that his production is not just fueled by like these big gains on a play-to-play basis. He's succeeding to a substantial degree greater than what his teammates were. But that also doesn't take away from the fact that he was incredible as a big play guy. Um, His breakaway conversion rate, 47%, is a 97th percentile mark. Just ridiculous. Um, And he's a tackle breaker. His 0.30 missed tackles force per attempt per PFF is sixth in the class. And right there with guys from the past like Todd Gurley, Kareem Hunt, Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara. Like, dude is great out in space. His yards after the catch per reception is an 83rd percentile number, 11.6. So it doesn't matter if he's, like, gotten there, you know, in the secondary on a run, if he's just out on a swing pass. Like, he is just making dudes miss in the open field, making things happen, creating big plays. And he's a quality receiver. His target share was 10%, which is in the 63rd percentile, which... A 63rd percentile target share, considering his dominator rating was in the 25th percentile, is pretty notable. He wasn't super involved in the offense overall, but they're making a concerted effort to get him involved in the passing game, which speaks well to his ability as a receiver. He was also efficient, 10 yards per reception, 7 yards per target. Those are 83rd and 62nd percentile numbers. And he was split out wide over 13% of the time, which is a 77th percentile number. So he's being moved around the formation, really efficient on his targets, involved relative to his overall role. Dude's kind of a beast. So kind of the bottom line with him is he was, you know, an Austin Eckler, like David Johnson level dude at the FCS level. He's got a three down skill set. He's super athletic. I think he's probably not a pure lead back type, but he's really dynamic, really versatile. He also has this trump card where during his time at Florida State, you know, playing special teams, playing linebacker, he's going to enter the league with 29 career tackles in college, which like who gives a fuck about, you know, running back tackles. It doesn't say anything to how good he is as a running back, obviously, but since 2007, among guys drafted to the league, 29 would be the third most tackles in the last 15 years for a running back prospect, which, you know, these fringe guys who are being, you know, looked at in the fifth, sixth rounds, being able to contribute on special teams, being able to, you know, block on a punt or, you know, chase down on a, on a kickoff. These are important things for like the back of roster guys and all things being equal. An NFL team is going to like a guy with that dog in him, with that willingness, with that experience than a guy who doesn't have those things. So I think it's a good sign that he got that opportunity and showed a willingness to do that. So RB7 is a Quandre White. On to RB6 is Damian Pierce. I've had a little bit of an interesting journey in my evaluation with Damian Pierce. I think early on, like a look at those implicit metrics, he's not good at all. His dominator ratings, not high, never higher than the 45th percentile, never more than 800 yards from scrimmage in a college season. He had 329 carries in his career. That's a 26th percentile number. His target share was a 5% number. That's in the 12th percentile. Like he just was not used at all in college, which 
you know, bird's eye view does not look good. We want our running back prospects to command volume at the college level relative to players who aren't quite good enough to be in the NFL. And Damian Pierce just didn't do that. However, I know a lot of film guys are in love with Damian Pierce. Like at the Senior Bowl, he had people creaming all over themselves watching him pass block. You know, film guys love how he looks as a ball carrier. They like him as a pass catcher. And I spent my fair share of time like firing off tweets, like dunking on people for liking a guy who didn't do shit in college. But I've kind of come around. Looking at, you know, box adjusted efficiency, taking a closer look at these efficiency metrics, I think Damien Pierce is a good player. His efficiency relative to his teammates, 0.56 yards per carry plus, uh, 0.93% chunk rate plus, right around average, 52nd percentile, 49th percentile, so not great, but taken into the context that he was playing with really talented teammates in that backfield, they averaged 4.04 stars as a collective as high school recruits. That's an 89th percentile group. And given the volume he had, given the level of teammates he was playing with, based on historical data, we would expect an NFL quality guy in that situation to post a yards per carry plus of 0.18. So the 52nd percentile mark that Pierce did post of 0.56 looks a little bit more impressive in the context of like his volume and the running backs he was playing with. So I like to see that. And he saw higher box counts than the other guys on the team. Um, His relative box count was 0.12, which is a 69th percentile number. His box adjusted efficiency still right around average at 48th percentile. But I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that he's not creating many big plays. His breakaway conversion rate was 25%, which is a 26th percentile number. So when he's getting to the second level, he's not converting those into, you know, breakaway gains at a high rate. But from play to play, his relative success rate is 9.4%, which is number one in the class, is a 98th percentile mark. If we just take for granted, okay, he's not a big play runner. Confirmed. Got it. Not going to create big plays. Given that... He's incredibly consistent relative to the other guys on his team. So I think he's a good running back despite low volume and despite not creating big plays. And he's a quality receiver despite low volume as well. He was used incredibly dynamically. He was targeted on average 1.7 yards down the field, which is a 76th percentile number. And he was split out wide almost 25% of the time. 89th percentile, and he averaged 8.3 yards per target. His catch rate on those passes downfield was an 88% number, which is 78th percentile, 92nd percentile. I think he's a quality receiver, and like I said earlier, he is apparently a tremendous pass blocker. So, take for granted, low volume, not used much, very consistent on the ground. He's a big dude. He's 5'9", 220, so short, incredibly stout you know, proportionally built like guys like Nick Chubb, James Conner, Najee Harris. So he's a rocked up dude, catches the ball well, used dynamically as a receiver, consistent runner. I think it's clear that he was just like underutilized in college, despite being like a well-built dude with a three down skill set, you know, that dynamic receiving usage, grown man rushing efficiency. And in my process, I take all of these like rushing efficiency metrics, physical measurables, things like that. And I put them in and like compare current prospects to past prospects and generate like similarity scores as a way of, you know, kind of finding comps for these guys. And despite the low volume, given his body type, given his efficiency numbers, he comps pretty strongly to guys like Darius Geis and Ezekiel Elliott. So I think there's a little bit of meat left on the bone here from what we saw in college. I think he's going to be a better pro than he was a college player. I don't know that he's, you know, a lead back type in the NFL. I think he has that capability. We'll see if it happens for him. But I think he's got a three down skill set and I think he's a really good player. So Damian Pierce ends up at my RB6. My RB5 is a guy I talked about uh, in the randomizer video a little bit ago, but this is Tyler Algier. He had an interesting kind of college career as well. He redshirted as a freshman at BYU his sophomore season. He also played linebacker a little bit, kind of like Zaquandre White. Not sure why they had him doing that. He was actually a walk-on, so it took him a little bit of time to just kind of assert himself as a a good player who deserved touches on offense. But as a junior, he had a 22% dominator rating in the 46th percentile. So, you know, he's kind of starting to get going. And then this last year, his senior year, 36% dominator rating in the 84th percentile. So he became a really good producer. And I think he's a decent receiver. His 10% target share is a 62nd percentile number. 
He was decently efficient, seven yards per target. That's a 62nd percentile number. I do, however, think a lot of that is fueled by his ability as a ball carrier. His average depth of target was negative 1.7, which is a 12th percentile number. So he's catching the ball almost two yards behind the line of scrimmage. Um, He's not being split out wide very often at all. His catch rate is only 73%, which given the degree of difficulty of like lining up in the backfield, running you know, parallel to where he lined up and catching the ball two yards behind the line of scrimmage. That's a 37th percentile catch rate, like not good. But once he caught the ball, he was averaging 11.2 yards after the catch per reception, which is a 78th percentile number. So swinging out, catching a ball, making a corner miss, you know, running over a safety or something. It's impressive, but impressive as a ball carrier more than it is as a receiver. So I think his target share numbers are a little bit, you know, misleading. I think he's probably not quite there as a receiver. Um, I don't know that he's going to fuck it up on third down, but I think most NFL teams will have a better option on third down than Tyler Algier. However, he was incredibly efficient as a runner. He averaged two yards per carry more than the other guys at BYU, which is a 93rd percentile number. Just ridiculous. And at first, I, I kind of addressed this in that randomizer video when I talked about Algier, but at first, I was kind of under the impression that he displayed some like lack of consistency, maybe a lack of nuance, you know, vision, manipulating linebackers, things like that at the point of attack, given his, you know, 10 yard run rate was only in the 38th percentile, but his breakaway conversion rate was in the 74th percentile, which if your high efficiency is fueled by long runs rather than like play to play consistency, similar to Brees Hall kind of calls into question like, okay, how consistent of a runner actually are you? You know, how nuanced, how good is your vision? Things like that. But if we look at the box adjusted stats, His box-adjusted efficiency rating, 128%, 89th percentile, and his relative success rate, which I I think is a better measure of consistency than chunk rate is, his relative success rate was 7%, which is in the 88th percentile. So, given that, I'm fairly confident in his being, like, nearly a full package as, like, a a pure, like, two-down runner, you know? He's also a tackle breaker, 0.29 missed tackles forced per attempt really good. He wasn't playing with talented teammates. They averaged just 2.3 stars as high school recruits, but given volume, given the talent level of those teammates, we would expect him to outdo those teammates by like 0.7 yards per carry. If he was an NFL quality back, he outdid them by two yards per carry. So even outdoing the expectation of an NFL quality guy by a significant amount, you know, he's 5'11", 220. Allegedly, he's got 4'4 speed. We'll see later this week, but prototype size, supposedly good athleticism, decent, you know, passable receiver, maybe really good on the ground. I think he's a high end, like two down committee guy with potential for, you know, more than that. I think he could be, you know, a really good running back. He has that trump card of having played defense a little bit too. He's got 27 tackles. If you're looking at the end of the roster, he's either going to get cut or he's going to be the third or second guy. If he has special teams and defensive experience and somebody else doesn't, maybe the the nod goes to Algier. So we like to see that as well. Uh, My RB4, Kenneth Walker. I think this is also probably a little bit lower than consensus has him, but he was just undeniably really, really, really good as a two-down runner, just a pure runner, one of the best we've seen. He saw 0.22 more defenders in the box on average than his teammates did, which is in the 86th percentile. So we know he wasn't a great receiver, playing on first and second down a lot. Defenses are giving him a lot of respect and he's efficient anyway. He averaged a yard and a half per carry more than his teammates did. It's an 85th percentile. His chunk rate was 5% higher than theirs. Um, His breakaway conversion rate, 40%. Those are 85th and 89th percentile numbers. He's a tackle breaker. 0.33 missed tackles forced per attempt. Number one in the class. Even accounting for those those box counts, 146% box adjusted efficiency rating, number one in the class. 9.3% relative success rate, number two in the class. Those are 96th and 95th percentile marks. The dude is just simply one of the best pure runners we've seen come out in some time. He is very, very good as a pure runner. As a producer, he spent his first two seasons at Wake Forest, was not overly productive as a freshman, just a 9% dominated rating. His yardage output stayed pretty consistent from freshman to sophomore year, but his touchdowns jumped from 4 to 13, which resulted in a 33% sophomore dominator rating, which is 87th percentile. And that's the uh, fifth best sophomore dominator rating in the ACC since 2007. So pretty impressive in historical context. And then this last season, he transferred to Michigan State, where he posted a 37% dominator rating. Like, obviously, he blew up. He had like 1,600 rushing yards. He was just, you know, maybe the best running back in the Big Ten. 
And that junior dominator rating is the eighth highest among third-year players in the Big Ten since 2007. So again, historically dominant. And that breakout age, you know, he broke out as a sophomore, age 19.9, 63rd percentile. Very good production profile. However, given all of those good things, he does have potentially fatal flaws in his profile. Based on historical data, I project him to be like 5'9", 211 at the Combine, which would be fine, not great. There is a little bit of risk that he's like anywhere, you know, up to 5'10", you know, maybe 204, 205 pounds, which would take him from like DeAndre Swift size, you know, J.K. Dobbins size, to like Bilal Powell or Tony Pollard, which for a lot of players would not be an issue, but he's not a good receiver. You know, I say that there's risk for him being smaller than I project, given, you know, he... I know a lot of film guys like think he looks smaller than he was listed um, on the Michigan State roster. My guy Chris Moxley from CampusToCanton.com has done research into which you know kind of college programs overinflate their listed weights for their guys relative to what they eventually weigh at the combine. Michigan State, on average, their running backs weigh four and a half pounds less at the combine than they did during their final season on campus. So he was listed at 210. If he stays consistent with that trend of Michigan State running backs. Maybe he's only 205 pounds. If he's 5'10", 205, he's too tall, too small to, you know, based on historical trends, get high volume as an NFL running back, which is especially concerning given that he doesn't contribute in the passing game. He had just 19 career receptions in college. That's a 13th percentile number, 5% career best target share, 14th percentile. And sometimes you come across a guy who was you know, not involved at all, but efficient on low volume. Not the case for Kenneth Walker. 4.6 yards per target, 16th percentile, 61% catch rate in just the fifth percentile. So I don't even know that he has good hands. Like it's just not, it, it's just really concerning that he's not going to be able to contribute in the passing game. And especially given his size, it's hard to see a guy like that finding a solid role in the NFL. It's like if Derrick Henry you know, was 210 pounds. He doesn't contribute much in the passing game. Obviously a huge, massive tank of a man, great running back, great pure runner. If he was much smaller than he is, if he was 210, even 205 pounds, like what is Derrick Henry in the NFL? Not nearly what he is now. Um, or like if Dalvin Cook didn't contribute all at all in the passing game. Dalvin Cook is 5'10", 210, like maybe the same size as Kyron Williams, but he's a quality receiver, you know, 30, 40, 50 receptions a season. Kenneth Walker's not to that level. If Dalvin Cook was a zero in the passing game, which Kenneth Walker nearly is, I don't know that he gets as much like first, second down work as he does. Um, You just can't put like that small of a guy on the field when there's absolutely no threat that he's going to catch the ball. Legit producer, no doubt, great pure runner, no evidence of pass catching ability, possibly too small. RB4 might be too high, honestly, depending on what we see at the combine. But given his ability as a pure runner, I currently have him this high. I hope he has requisite size. RB3. I went back and forth with my RB3 and my RB2 quite a bit, but I think I, uh, you know, am pretty happy with where I have them. My RB3 is Rashad White out of Arizona State. And I had a little bit of an interesting journey with him as well. I hopped on a podcast with Felix Sharp over at CampusToCanton.com about a month ago where I called Rashad White a jag. I've compared him to Tony Pollard and James Starks and Kenyon Drake because he's relatively tall and skinny, and despite three-down ability, we often don't see guys who are as tall as he is, as skinny as he is. We don't see them have like high-volume, you know, high-weighted opportunity roles in the NFL, and I was scared of that. I'm, I'm still a little bit scared of that. However, he was listed at Arizona State at six foot two and 210 pounds, which would be awful for a running back. Like, we don't want our guys built like T. Higgins taking, you know, snaps in the backfield. However, he weighed in at the Senior Bowl at six foot and half an inch, which is significantly better than six foot two. He's still at just 39th percentile weight at 210, proportionally built like Bryce Love still, but. He's not as tall, he's not as, as much of a giraffe as we thought he was. To add, you know, a little bit of historical context to that build he has, there have been 82 running backs drafted since 2007 who are between 6 foot and 6 one. Rashad White is 6 foot and a half, so right in there. Their average weight at the combine was 221 pounds, and only 13 of them weighed 210 or less. At the Senior Bowl, 6 foot and a half, 210. Historically small given his frame, and really... I've been trying to think of like examples of guys who are really usable in fantasy with that body type. The only one I can think of in the last like 15 years is Darren McFadden. I don't know that Rashad White is that level of player. 
Tough to say that he'll be Darren McFadden in the NFL, but this whole thought process, I realized I was being a little bit hypocritical. You know, I love Kenneth Gainwell. I love Austin Eckler. I love Duke Johnson. I love Christian McCaffrey. I love a lot of these small guys with three down skill sets. And despite this notion that like you have to be big in order to get work in the NFL, it's my position that if you have a three down skill set like McCaffrey does, like I think Gainwell does, like Eckler does, you will get work in spite of your size. I think we've seen that over time with these full skill set guys who happen to be small. And I got to thinking, if that logic applies to small players, why does it not extend to guys who aren't necessarily small, but are thin, just like a, you know, a scaled up version of a small player? What's the difference between 5'9", 205 and 6 foot 210? A couple inches, a couple pounds, but proportionally, it's basically the same thing. So, if I'm in on Kenneth Gainwell, I kind of have to be in on Rashad White. And so here I am, I'm in on Rashad White. A lot of those guys from before, like Kenyon Drake, James Starks that I was comparing him to, were not as efficient on the ground as Rashad White was. He was very good as a runner in college. He played with teammates at Arizona State who averaged 3.67 stars as high school recruits. That's a 68th percentile group. He saw basically the same box counts as they did, but relative to those guys, he averaged 1.34 yards per carry greater than they did, 81st percentile. His 10-yard run rate was almost 3% higher than theirs, 69th percentile. And while he wasn't you know, creating a lot of big plays. His breakaway conversion rate is just a 46 percentile mark. That, you know, kind of paradoxically speaks to his ability to be efficient despite not being a huge big play runner, which I like. And considering the box counts he faced, his the average carry for Rashad White was 131 percent the output of the other guys on the team, 93rd percentile, and he was not incredibly consistent relative to his teammates. His success rate was just 0.8% higher than theirs, 48th percentile. On aggregate, I think he was a very efficient runner relative to quality teammates at Arizona State. And even going back to his time at community college, he was there as a junior and as a sophomore. He averaged 2.3 yards per carry more than the guys at community college. And, you know, going back, like, that's better than what Westbrook, David Johnson, Austin Eckler, Danny Woodhead, James Robinson, that's better team relative efficiency than those guys posted at the non-FBS level. I think Rashad White was a great small school guy, continued to be really good as, you know, a producer at the FBS level. And I I actually think, you know, another negative on his profile is that he's coming out as a fifth-year guy. And part of that, I think, was due to COVID. He transferred to Arizona State as a junior posted a 30% dominator rating in just a four-game season. He wasn't hurt, but COVID meant that Arizona State only played four games. He had 571 yards and six touchdowns in those four games, 100 scrimmage yards every game he played that season. If COVID hadn't happened and he had the opportunity to play a full schedule, you know, at that rate, maybe he declares last season and he's not, you know, this this super old running back prospect. Uh, Maybe he doesn't waste a season, you know, coming back and proving to scouts that, he's a legitimate player. That's kind of a pattern I had noticed with this running back class. They seem to be old, seems to be lots of five-year guys, and so I looked into it. The average age of running back draftees as of September 1st of their rookie seasons is 22.57 years old. That's going back to 2007. So 2007 through 2020, the average age of a rookie running back is 22.57. The average age of guys in this class as of September 1st of this year will be 22.9. So they're about a third of a year older than normal running back prospects. And since 2017, so in the last five years, out of 103 guys drafted, 10 running backs spent five or more years in college. So less than 10% of historical running back prospects have been guys who spent five years or more in college. In this year, we don't know who's drafted yet, obviously, but of the 36 running backs invited to the combine, 12 of them spent five or more years in college. So we go from historically less than 10% of running backs to now in this class, a third of running backs spent five five or more years in college. I think that's clearly due to COVID. Like that fucked up that 2020 season for a lot of people. And especially in the case of a guy like Rashad White, who came out of the non-FBS level, first year at Arizona State, really productive, wasn't able to get a lot of eyeballs on him, wasn't able to prove it over a large enough sample in order to declare. Um, You know, maybe he wouldn't have even been drafted despite a really good season last year because it was such a short schedule. So I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm willing to latch onto that productive season given that he proved it this year and say like, he didn't take too long. He just got fucked over. So 
I think despite his thin frame, he's a complete back. He was a good producer at multiple levels, efficient runner, dynamic receiver, and I think the problems in his profile can like reasonably be explained away. So I think there are a lot of potential like avenues his career could go. I think he has like workhorse potential. I think if a team wants him to be like a big satellite back like Kenyon Drake or Tony Pollard, I think he can do that. I think he could be like a really good three down committee guy. I think there's a lot of ways his career could turn out and that's you know, we want to see that. There's a lot of ways in which he could succeed. And I keep coming back to, like, Alvin Kamara. I don't know that, you know, I'm not willing to step out on a limb and say Rashad White is an Alvin Kamara-level guy, but I think we should be looking at him in a similar way to how we viewed Alvin Kamara's range of outcomes as a prospect. You know, he had decent size, was not overly productive in college, but you could see a three-down skill set, really dynamic receiving usage, efficient quality runner. You know, that guy could be a big satellite back. He could be a committee runner. He could be a two-down runner. And obviously at the high end of his range of outcomes, which Kamara has hit, he's like an elite fantasy producer, like three-down Swiss Army knife kind of weapon. I think Rashad White maybe won't hit the same highs as Alvin Kamara will. It's hard to predict any guy will do that. But I think he has a similar range of outcomes, and I'm really... Really encouraged about his potential in the NFL. So he's my RB3 in this class. My RB2 is Kevin Harris out of South Carolina. And this is a little bit out on a limb. It I don't know if it feels hot takey, but like the numbers are what they are. He is not getting any love from the scouting community, from the dynasty community as far as I can tell. Nobody is into Kevin Harris. He must have boring film. That's That's got to be it. Because as a producer, he was incredible. He only played five games as a true freshman at South Carolina in the SEC. In those five games, 22% dominator rating. That's an 81st percentile mark for true freshmen. His dominator rating as a sophomore, I say this without exaggeration. He had one of the greatest sophomore seasons in college football history from a market share standpoint. In the SEC, he posted a 45.8% dominator rating as a true sophomore. That's a 99th percentile number. It's the second highest sophomore dominator rating in my entire database, only behind Donnell Pumphrey at San Diego State in the Mountain West. So among Power 5 conference guys, he has the best sophomore dominator rating at least in the last 15 years. And if you just look at guys in the SEC, like he had 1,300 yards and 16 touchdowns that year. Like he blew up. That's a higher dominator rating than guys like Leonard Fournette, Nick Chubb, Herschel Walker, Emmett Smith, Bo Jackson, Jamal Lewis, Todd Gurley, Darren McFadden, Darius Geis, Better than all of those guys posted as true sophomores in the SEC. He was absolutely incredible. Unfortunately, late in that season, he like suffered a back injury, ended up having surgery, came back in time to play this season. Probably still some lingering effects from that back injury. His dominator rating dipped to dipped to 16%, just a 29th percentile number. You know, there were also some other quality running backs on the teams. Aquandre White was part of that committee. Marshawn Lloyd is a young guy who's pretty good, who is part of that committee. So he wasn't, you know, the only guy in the backfield. But yeah, he did take a little bit of a step back. He's a big dude, 5'10", 220, really stout, um, good build. I see rumblings on Twitter of him being like a slow guy, just kind of a boring runner. I did find a tweet from one of these like player tracking data analytics guys at South Carolina that tracked him at 21.8 miles an hour on a run during his sophomore season, which is the same speed that Derrick Henry and Jalen Waddle reached on their fastest ball carrying play of 2021. So at least pre-back injury, you would think at least two years removed from that, he's going to be faster going forward than he was in 2021, but pre-injury he was fucking fast. Like, he's as fast as Derrick Henry was. Like, I don't I don't know where this slow thing's coming from, but he's not a great receiver. Um, he did average 16 receptions per 12 games, which is 56th percentile. His 9% target share is pretty respectable. That's in the 56th percentile also, but he was not efficient. Um, 34th percentile yards per target, 36th percentile catch rate. I don't know that he's a strong contributor there in the NFL at all, but on the ground, at face value, his efficiency there doesn't look great either. yards per carry relative to his teammates. That's a 48th percentile number. His chunk rate was just 0.02% greater than theirs. That's in the 40th percentile, so pretty mediocre at face value. Until you consider the talent level of the guys that he was playing with, they averaged 3.56 stars as high school recruits. That's a 63rd percentile group. And when you consider the box counts that he was facing relative to those teammates, the average box count he saw was 0.4 defenders heavier than what was seen by his teammates on average, which is the highest number I've ever seen. So relative to teammates, he had the toughest road to efficiency of any running back, at least in this class and the last couple classes. And given those box counts, 
the average carry for Kevin Harris was worth 119.5% of the output of carries for all other South Carolina running backs, which is a 73rd percentile number, and he was incredibly consistent relative to his teammates. His 7.2% relative relative success rate is a 91st percentile number. That's the third highest I've ever seen. And he was good in the open field. He converted 34% of his 10-yard runs into breakaway gains of 20 or more. That's a 65th percentile number. So he's a big dude, really productive early on, dynamic in the open field, really consistent as a runner, facing incredibly high box counts, productive and efficient in spite of them relative to teammates who were quality players. I think he has the best mix of size and pure running ability of any running back in the class, like even more than Brees Hall. He doesn't have the consistency concerns that we see from Brees Hall. He's a bigger dude than both Kenneth Walker and Rashad White. Kind of comparing him to Kenneth Walker, sort of probably the best two pure runners in the class. How do I justify having him above Kenneth Walker? Well, he's bigger. And despite not being a strong pass catcher, he's not a complete zero there like Kenneth Walker probably is. So I think it's justified. Um, He was a dominant producer potentially elite size speed combo. If he's fast, you know, I think he comps to guys like Nick Chubb, Leonard Fournette, as far as like size speed combo, efficiency numbers on the ground. And if he's slow, like he's still going to comp to guys like James Conner, Le'Veon Bell, Damian Harris. I think he's just a really quality runner of the football, impressive production resume, good size, hopefully good speed. Even if not, I think he's a good player. So he lands at my RB2 and that's going to be a lot higher than probably anybody else has him, but I think he's good, you know, and that's a good thing for me. I, I'm not going to have to take him at the 102. Isaiah Spiller, Kenneth Walker, Kyron Williams up there, 103, 105, probably letting somebody else take that chance unless, unless Kenneth Walker's like 215 pounds, but Kevin Harris in the third round of a rookie draft, like fuck yeah. So quickly go through the top 10 again. Let's see if I can do it off memory. RB10, Kyron Williams. 9, Isaiah Spiller, 8, Letty Brown, 7, Zaquandre White, 6, Damian Pierce, 5, Tyler Algier, 4, Kenneth Walker, 3, Rashad White, 2, Kevin Harris, number 1, Brees Hall. That is how I view this running back class shaking out, basically in pure talent. Hope you enjoyed. Um, Thanks for sticking around to the end. If you did so, smash that like and subscribe button, am I right? (laughs) Later this week, Uh, We'll have the combine. I think on Sunday, I'll have a video coming out. Uh, Mike on the channel kind of made me think of this. He brought up, he kind of posed the question of like trading an early 2022 first for a random 2023 first and like how viable that would be. Um, So I kind of wanted to look at that in the context of the running back class of 2023. You know, if you trade the 103 this year for a random 2023 first, you end up with the 109. Like how good of a running back could you expect to get with that pick? So I'll kind of be diving into some of the, the top guys in 2023 seeing how good that class is, how deep it is. So expect to see that video this weekend. But other than that, have a good one. Peace.